Greetings, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Rick Grafton, chairman of Westgate Energy, a startup microcap energy company focused on the Manville Stack Fairway, located in East Central Alberta and West Central Saskatchewan. Mr. Grafton has over 30 years of investing experience and has completed over $20 billion of energy investment transactions. In 1993, Mr. Grafton co-founded First Energy Capital Corp. in Calgary, Alberta with Mr. Brett Wilson, Jim Davidson, and Murray Edwards. Mr. Grafton has been a founding shareholder and board member of many leading high-growth energy companies including Northrock, Amber Energy, Athabasca, Pipestone, Tourmaline, and Bellatrix Energy. Mr. Grafton graduated from the University of British Columbia with a Bachelor of Commerce degree in Finance. Among other things, we sat down and discussed starting a new energy company, old stories from energy investment banking, and why the next 10 years in energy will be profitable. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Galatea Technologies. Galatea is a software company based in Calgary that is focused on helping producers better manage their fluid logistics. Galatea enables field operators and truck drivers with the ability to make the optimal decision on every waste, water, or clean oil load, resulting in 20% savings on trucking and disposal costs. The Galatea platform makes it easy to create digital truck tickets, manifests, and shipping documents that automatically flow through the field data capture and finance systems. Galatea's platform is used by over 50% of Canadian producers, 600 trucking companies, and hundreds of disposal locations. Visit GalateaTech.com to learn more about how to optimize that last line on your lease op. This podcast is sponsored by HeadRacingCanada.com. In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is now offering free shipping on European factory performance ski gear. By passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers, HeadRacingCanada.com offers the lowest pricing available in Canada. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your new ski gear for the season. Good morning, Mr. Rick Grafton. Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure. I know your time is valuable, but anyone that does listen will appreciate your insights. Okay, we're good. Quincently did an episode with Mr. Brett Wilson two weeks ago, and he mentioned that you were one of the best partners he could have had. So I would say that eight years that Brett and uh, Murray and Jim and I were partners at First Energy was a big highlight of my career. I thought for the purposes of today's conversation, we could structure it loosely uh, around uh, maybe a trip down memory lane to Peters and Co. and First Energy, and then get your thoughts on uh, Westgate and whatnot. Sure. I uh, was born in Calgary and grew up in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, That's going way back. But after spending five years getting a finance degree out of UBC, I moved back to Calgary in 1980. And it became abundantly clear to me, I was in the investment business then, that if you wanted to be in the investment business, you better be in the oil and gas investment business. And Peters & Company was the only boutique firm of that nature. So I spent 10 years at Peters. Great guys, great partners. We had a lot of fun, a lot of stampede parties, financed a lot of independent oil and gas companies, brought global money into the independent industry, and basically reshaped the business. And independent companies like Poco, Renaissance, North Star, Morrison, and I can go on and on. Uh, We're very, very successful and capital poured in because these companies were successful and investors made a lot of money. So that was was a great time. First Energy, we tried to do some things a little different. One of the things we did different, I don't know if people know this, but we took 1.5% of our profits every year and we gave that to philanthropic events. And that built up even after I left and... I believe that First Energy gave over $125 million to the philanthropic, and they did some great, very rifle shot approaches. So it was a very good example how allowing companies to be profitable, they also become very philanthropic. And Brett is uh, one of the masters at that and continues to have parties. 
my take on Brett is that he likes having parties as much as he <laughs> likes the philanthropic side, but that's that's just a little shot. So no, the Peters and Co alumni. Why have so many successful people come from that company? Well, that is a hundred percent because of Rob's philosophy. He built an environment where you, what we said, you eat what you kill. Uh, he paid none of us any salaries. We paid our own expenses and he gave us the world to go build a business on. And he gave us the platform. And out of that, we built a team of guys that got up every morning and they went at it and did some fabulous things. And as I said, I mean, I don't know the number, but I do believe it was in the 60s or 70s of companies that we financed that went on to be very, very successful. Canadian Natural Resources was one. Renaissance Energy was one. But Morrison, North Star, North Rock, all of those were extremely successful. And that was the environment. And it was fun to work at. And they were great guys. And Rob, bless his soul, he, he just got out of our way. He was a very charismatic character. Probably will go down as a legend in, in my mind of just the way Rob approached life. Got up every morning in Millerville and he raced his Porsche into town and then he raced back out and he he was a fabulous salesman. He loved the oil and gas business. He loved Calgary. He loved the Stampede. So it was, it was a very great environment. Yeah. And then you had Mr. Mike Timms, and then you were there, and there's a long list of people. Oh, yeah. Wilf Gobert was a fabulous analyst, great partner. Guys uh, like Jeff Cummings one day showed up in our office and became very successful because Rob was notorious for one day there'd be an empty seat and Rob would fill it. Uh, JP of each came and great bull rider. And I don't know what that had to do with the investment business, but Rob saw something in JP and, and uh, next thing you know, he was sitting at the sales desk. Guys like Bob Wilkinson, fabulous guy, talked to all the biggest investors in the world. Peter Lynch from Fidelity and, you know, Peter would call in every day. Uh, we talked to everybody. Bob was very unique. He went to OPEC meetings every year. He was a, a legend in my mind and just a great, fine guy. So I was very lucky. I've, I've worked with great guys. Did you think to yourself that I need to work at Peters & Co. and that this is really a big opportunity? Absolutely. No, they that was the place to be. Yeah, without a doubt, that was the place to be. Mm -hmm. So when I found out they were hiring, I called Rob right away. I, I hadn't met Rob before other than at a breakfast at the Peak Club where he spoke, but that was where I wanted to be. And that was, it was very clear to me. Uh, yeah, I struck a great deal with Rob. He gave me a desk. He gave me no money, <laughs> and no salary, and no cash. and said, okay, see you later. But what he did, which was, he, <laughs> after about a month there, he threw six cards on my desk and he said, okay, Rick, we're going over to the UK, call these guys up, and I'm going on a wedding in India and uh, I'll meet you there. And uh, that transformed that into having 40 clients who became best friends in both London and Edinburgh and routinely went there. And I think if you ask guys like Ron Green, it was some of the most fun road trips he ever had because we saw great clients, clients that were global investors, and they were used to being long, long-term shareholders. I've got lots of stories about how loyal they were to Renaissance and how long they held the stock and how the Scottish guys were fabulous shareholders, all accountants. That was their background. But so it was a great time. That was in the 80s, and then things started to really pick up in the 90s, and you moved over to First Energy. When uh, Murray and I got together the Christmas in 1992, and we just talked where we felt there was more room in the marketplace, broader approach. Peters was very selective. That That is their strength even today. And uh, we had a broader perspective on what could happen in the energy business. Murray's good friend was Brett uh, Wilson, and then Jim Davidson was uh, also, I believe, Murray's broker at the time. And when I look back, obviously, four guys with a little amount of capital 
in terms of what it takes to start a company today. We all left our jobs on Friday and Monday morning, September, after the long weekend. We were at the desk and we were trading. And we um, did 19 deals over the first 90 days until Ontario Securities Commission shut us down because we we hadn't got to license with them yet. And I already tell that story just because you just couldn't do it today. The regulatory guys would not let that happen. But Brett flew down in a plane and gave him a whole bunch of boxes and off we were. So, And our focus was helping oil and gas companies get capital and being very long-term shareholders with them. And we were aligned with them. They were great companies. I mean, the company management owned a lot of stock. The shareholders were long-term shareholders. And in certain incidents, we owned a a position in, in the shares as well. Again, very different model than what goes on today. In hindsight, First Energy turned out really well. But at the time, I think it was the fall of 92, 93, were you thinking to yourself, this is the biggest opportunity I've ever had in my life and I really need to capitalize on this? Or were you just trying to pay the bills? <laughs> I was, <laughs> By that time, I'd crossed the barrier of paying the bills. No, I, not at all. I, you know, I, I got up every morning and I don't know if I felt lucky or not. I felt I was in a good position. I had good partners and... Uh, we went at it every day. I was never fearful of success because I I never doubted that. And if you meet a guy like Jim Davidson, you he's an extremely optimistic guy. And uh, we just went at it every day. We weren't thinking about the past. We were just thinking day to day, put the deals together, do our jobs. And that was good. Um, one question I've always wondered is why start first energy? What was the angle or the opportunity that you saw? I'm sure this is a dirty word, but money, <laughs> money, you know, uh, Rob owned the majority of Peters and company. And he said, I'm not retiring until I'm 55 years old. And I looked back and I said, well, whoa, that's a long time. I'm not waiting around for that change. So it was kind of like that was the aha moment. But then I always wanted to start my own firm. I literally wanted to do that from the day I got in the business. I'm very naive to think I could do that because it is very complicated to do. But my partners helped me do that. And that was my dream to start my own investment firm. Um, you all put your own money in, which created a alignment with your clients. How important do you think that aspect was to the success of the most, the most important and both. Jim, Murray, Brett and I put equal amounts in. The other four partners that came in to put capital in, we all had significant capital, uh, significant. And every year we doubled that capital. So, I mean, it was a very prosperous thing, but that's, it was about the money. I don't think that's a dirty word. Uh, Every guy that started that company, every guy that worked in the company were very generous. They did a lot of good things uh, with that money. When Things really started to pick up in the nineties. Were you aware of that? Did you did you get a sense that money was really starting to flow into Western Canada in energy or we raised over five billion dollars every year. And that was the way the capital was flowing in. And the capital was flowing in because they could get a return on that money and a return on the growth of those companies that they invested in. And it was a very, very good environment. I don't want to get politically here, but the first Trudeau caused the collapse of Dome Petroleum, caused the collapse of the energy business, and capital flowed out. And between 93 and eight years ago, capital continued to flow into Canada. Capital is flowing out now. And if capital flows out, returns go down. If returns go down, people don't make money. If people don't make money, corporately, they don't. They become less generous, and that's what happened. So in our period of time... Global investors were putting money into Canada because they could make money. And and the oil and gas business was one of the best places to make money. Did you know that? Or yes. You were highly aware. You bet. <laughs> you could see it. The oil and gas index was 25% of the TSX. Now I think it's six. And that's all just capital flows. Fast forward to today. You haven't had to work in a while. You got grandkids now and whatnot, but here we are. And I enjoy it. I believe the next 10 years is going to be the best decade that the energy business has ever seen. 
And what's driving that is a lack of capital that is coming into the industry. And when capital dries up, the returns within the industry get better. And when capital dries up, globally, oil and gas can invest less to increase supply. But on a global basis, demand increases every year. And it's over 100 million barrels a day. And over the next decade, it will grow one and a half, two percent every year. Demand will grow. Supply will stay flat unless they get more access to capital. The business is more profitable. In Canada, is cleaner than it's ever been. It is more sensitive to environmental issues. It's more diverse. And it is a hell of a business. It's just a great business. It's a great business for young people to get into. It's very entrepreneurial. So this decade's going to be great. In Canada, we're going to get Trans Mountain. We're going to get the LNG. And I don't know if your listeners quite follow on what the LNG uh, Kitimat will mean, but they're going to bring on five trains in the next 10 years. And every train will take over two BCF of gas out of Canada. It will stabilize the Alberta ECO gas price, and it will be the most profitable industry in Canada, at least in the top five. So they will be able to find our gas at under $3 an MCF and sell our gas over $15 an MCF. And there's a global demand for that. We have a lot of natural resources in Alberta, and we're just part way in developing it. And we're going to develop it properly, cleanly. And there's a lot of side companies that spin out of that side investment side things. So it's going to be a great decade. I was going to ask you what motivates you nowadays, but you kind of just answered it. <laughs> I think building things, being involved, having a purpose. This oil company that I, that we've started about a year ago called Westgate, and we just did a financing and we can do an, an RTO, so we'll be public. I think I'm the only guy out there that's going public into the energy business, and I'm doing it because I think we're ahead of the curve. It's the right time. The monetary opportunity is there because of new technology of drilling multilateral wells into existing oil fields. Daniel Smith talked about increasing production in Alberta. That's a smart thing for our province. It's a smart thing for our country. And um, just this morning, Saskatchewan came out with a new set of rules, and Saskatchewan will be increasing production. That's very, very positive for the municipalities, for the provincial government, and the federal government will make more money. So it's a very, very positive thing. The demographics of Western Canada were younger, were more vibrant. People want to move here. People want a purpose. They want to do a job. It's a great time. Maybe for the listener, you were the CEO of Grafton Ventures, but before we get into Westgate, what is Grafton Ventures? Well, we started that because we I wanted to diversify more into, and we made a couple investments, <laughs> one in a helium company, another in oil and gas pipeline service business, and then starting a small oil company in Grafton Ventures. And I've decided just to basically focus solely on Westgate. So Grafton Ventures will no longer exist as an entity, and we will have one focused company that I'm focused on and that the team here, in a year, we've hired six guys. Three of them are from Saskatchewan, smart geologists, engineers. It's extremely exciting. Just a quick thank you to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. It's March of 2024. What's different about starting an energy company now versus, say, in the last eight years? Is it better now or what? Are you seeing opportunity now? The opportunity is there. Uh, it's very difficult to raise capital, which is a good and bad thing because if it was easy, everybody would. And the regulatory bodies after 
the last government we had. There's too much regulation in every business in Alberta. I know that Daniel Smith's going to do things to get that less. The AER, the Energy Department, they're all trying to figure out how is the best way to protect Albertans, clean up abandoned wells, and stimulate the economic environment in all the municipalities around. And we've just gone through a 10-year period of consolidation where you had to get bigger, at least 200,000 barrels a day. The main driver behind that, unless you're that big, the four major banks won't finance you. So if you can't get financing from the four major banks, your cost of capital is too high to be profitable. With this new technology, these wells are the most profitable wells ever drilled. It's not like a gas well or a Montney gas well where you get dreams of gas that's non-economical, but alongside of that, you get a condensate flow that makes it worthwhile. So natural gas currently is basically a waste byproduct. In this environment, which is primarily below Edmonton, and it's an area that has been drilled up vertically, now we can drill it up with multilaterals, technology, and it's very, very profitable. And the entry cost per well is one and a half million compared to 10 to 15 million in the Montney and the Duvernay. Now, there's a lot of great Montney Duvernay guys, and there'll be a further consolidation, but we need to get an environment within Alberta and Saskatchewan where independent companies do what their job is to develop assets so the larger companies can consolidate them. You just summarized it, but if you were to give an elevator pitch for Westgate, it is applying new technology to places like the Manville and Central Alberta? It's about growth. You want to invest in growth companies. The energy business is not shouldn't be called, well, that's the energy business. No, it's a growth business. I believe we can double the size of our business every year, actually twice a year for the next foreseeable future. And that is good business. And we can be profitable right out of the gates, a limited amount of capital, a limited amount of debt to grow into a substantial independent oil and gas company. Going public versus staying private. Well, I've done the private route and there's a lot of capital. And when you get that capital, understandably where that money comes from, they always have stewards who who have collected the capital to give to companies. And um, those stewards have accountants and lawyers and that oversee your every move. We've got a very experienced team here at Westgate. We can grow without their stewardship. And we have nine institutional shareholders that are supporting us. And I believe that number is going to grow. So other than regulatory issues of, I think it gives us a lot more flexibility. Do you worry the public markets won't recognize the value of Westgate in the in the open exchange? Sure, of course. But that's just part of doing business. What we're going to do is execute on our business plan. And as we execute on our business plan and we get that message out to our shareholders, we will develop long-term shareholders and we will make a rate of return on their money and our money. And that's the driver force. In terms of capital allocation, the idea is to grow, but do you foresee dividends or buy, uh, no. anything along those lines? How do you no, think I mean, our, like when you look at our business plan, which is in Westgates, we can get significant free cash flow developed over the next three to five years. That cash flow, if we have an opportunity to spend it on drilling, we'll continue to do that. If that opportunity stops for multiple reasons, we can always do things to enhance the shareholder value, their share buybacks. But what we're trying to build is something where we have a large inventory of drilling locations. I forgot to ask this. Do you remember Amber Energy? Sure. We put Amber together and the first deal they did was with Ranchman's Resources. It was 1,200 BOEs of non-operated assets and Richard Lewinsky, Bob Chason, Ken McNeil and a couple other guys put it together. And I remember we were very successful. We had drilled a gas well with Morrison and it came on gangbusters. And that was the start of it. But Richard Lewinsky and Bob were, Richard 
had worked for a Saskatchewan private enterprise, Sask Oil, and he found a, a land play in Pelican Lake, it was called. And he started buying tracts of land there. And I kept saying to Richard, what exactly are you doing? It costs a lot of money. You're running out of money. We were very we were very hands-on, these companies. And he said, no, Rick, there's massive amounts of oil in place. So as it turned out, uh, we built Amber to 20,000 BOEs, Pelican Lake. I had 6 billion plus barrels in place. And we, when we drilled the wells, they a term called cold flow because it was 12 to 14 degree gravity crude, but it did flow. And we sold it to Encana for a billion dollars. And it's now in the hands of Canadian Natural Resources. And they've got the reserves they from recovering 6% where we were. It's now 46%. They're doing polymer floods, massively successful. But Amber ran out of capital. It took a lot of capital to, to move it from where we were to there. But it was a very successful company. And Bob and Richard have moved on and, and Ken McNeil and done a number of other uh, successful companies. Uh, when Mr. Bob Chazon did the podcast, he told me it was went from 30 cents to $30 at one point. A couple splits involved too. But why did it go? What led to that? We did what I said. We grew production. We grew reserves. We were extremely profitable. And at the time, people were paying over 150000 of flowing BOE. Right now, they're paying 20000 of flowing BOE. The assets, not on a PDP basis, which is proven, developed, and producing, but the reserves in the ground at Pelican Lake were over 6 billion barrels. And we got paid for some of that. Mm. And, and that's why at $30 a share, I think it was worth a billion four or something like that. Why did you leave for Synergy? That was uh, simple. You know, my it was a great eight years. They were great partners. I was the oldest of a young group of guys. I had three kids who were 10, 12, and 14, and uh, I'd spent a lot of time working. And so I thought it was a very good time to take a break. And my wife and I decided to go to New Zealand and Australia for a year. It was the time of the um, Summer Olympics in Australia, and I'm a big uh, Olympic groupie, so we took my family down there, and uh, we had a friend in Melbourne, and we just had a great time. So I thought it was time. You have connections in Abu Dhabi. I guess the comment would be, you're good at bringing money into Canada. How did that come about and why? Well, when we started Grafton Asset Management, the plan was to raise a little capital to manage as a publicly listed portfolio. And we did that. We raised $100 million for Absolute. My partner at the time had connections in New York. And uh, through some of those connections, we were introduced to a gentleman called Mark Cutis. I was a speaker at the Millican Conference in Los Angeles, and Mark and I started a relationship, and he said, well, come over to Abu Dhabi. We have a fund, and I think we would like to invest alongside you. And so the opportunity at the time was to do joint ventures because there was so many, so much capital was required to drill the Montney Wells. And the fracking, we did, I don't know, 50, 60 fracks. And, and the wells cost upward to $8, 10000000 million a well. And so we needed the capital to develop that. So we did a fund. It was called CNOR, which is a Canadian non-operated resources. And the Abu Dhabi Investment Councilor was a lead order for that fund. It was $200 million. We went over to Abu Dhabi. It's a fabulous place for about five times. We went and met the risk people. We met everybody over there. My whole team met everybody over there. And so that money came in and we partnered with a group called Riverstone, which is probably the largest pure energy private equity group in New York. Clayton Woyd has happened to be on the board of that, who is the CEO of Renaissance. And we also then raised another 165 million alongside that. 
And the money was definitely there at that time, 2016, and the opportunities were there. And we did a joint venture with Tourmaline for close to $400 million. And we also acquired 95 sections of land from Ancana that we turned into a Montney producer called Pipestone. It was just recently sold to Strathcona. And we built that from zero to 35,000 BOE. So that was very successful. A good experience. Built a great team of guys. There was 45 guys that went on to run Pipestone and, and do a great job there. Speaking of lessons, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but Bellatrix. Bellatrix. What happened at Bellatrix? Um, was the start of our non-operated business. And we did a deal with them. and. We were partners and paid a hundred to earn, I want to say 60. And we built that asset up to 12,000 BOEs. And that asset required a significant gas plant. And that was Bellatrix on Bellatrix's balance sheet. So they leveraged up their balance sheet. And at the time, they had an investor out of New York called Orange capital. And that investor, like some of the New York investors, not to put a blanket on them, uh, really focused on net asset value. And they felt Bellatrix's net asset value was $12 a share. And the company was at trading at around eight to nine. They received a bought deal that would have cleaned up their balance sheet. And it was stopped because of Orange, because they said, we're not going to issue stock below net asset value. However, in not doing that, Bellatrix was in a, a never-ending death spiral where they had to sell assets to pay down the debt. And one of their most attractive assets was this gas plant. We had an agreement with them that our operating costs were X. And when they sold the gas plant to the other party, they increased operating costs by a 3X. And by doing that, it made the whole joint venture non-profitable. Interestingly, going forward, Bellatrix went into receivership, and it was bought by Spartan, who then turned the asset into an extremely successful thing. So what we did right was it was a great asset. We built it up. We were over 12,000 BOEs. We had a lot more wells to drill. And that Gas plant was brand new, state of the art, and we were making money. We paid back our investors 7%. And if it would have kept at that level, we would have paid our investors back. And it would have been a very profitable one. But it wasn't in our hands, and it was in Bellatrix's hands. And uh, we had obviously numerous conversations with them, but they were forced to do that transaction. And we had really our hands tied and going this back a little ways, a lawsuit would have been a lose-lose for both of us and and would have not really achieved anything. Speaking of good assets, do you get a tingling feeling nowadays when you see one? You've been in the sector for a long time. There's some significant assets that we're in the midst of talking to companies that will not be spending money on these assets, and we will. So they come by This is a smart group of guys out there. I'm not the only one that sees them. So it's it's competitive. And I like that. We're trying to be ahead of the curve. But that curve goes, someone always chasing you. I think someone always said, if you've got a great idea in Calgary, there's another dozen people that have that same idea. Yeah, exactly. So... What to you makes a good energy investment or team? What separates the best ones from the rest? You got to be laser focused and working on one goal and having capital. The management and directors will own over 22% of Westgate when we go public. So we're aligned with the shareholders. And so when we spend our money, when we spend their money, we're spending our money and we're so focused on that. I got to tell you, we get up in the morning, I come in and I sometimes I'm the first one. Usually Dan Brown's the first guy in. We just keep looking for good deals. And the deals have got to make money. We're we're here to every asset, every barrel we buy, we want it to make money. Mm -hmm. What to you is a good rate of return? Do you look at it that way or do you? you... Yeah. The the rates of return on these wells are 
we can get a return on our capital in the first nine months and we can get a 2x on our capital within two years. These wealths will go on producing. They decline at about 45%, but they produce for 25 years. So, What's the best deal you've ever seen? Uh, Murray Edwards started Canadian Natural when I was at Peter's. Not just a deal, what Murray has done to build Canadian Natural up into 1.4 million barrels a day. He is brilliant. He has a photographic memory and Canadian Natural is has been a star. Mike Rose at Tourmaline has done it four times. He's a star. Um, David Wilson at Kelt, fantastic. Grant Fagerheim, fantastic. These guys are all great guys, you know, so it's a good business to be in. It's not one. There's not one. It's a team of guys. And, and I feel we need more of those guys. We need more independent young guys out there. There's not as many of them right now because the oper- cause a lack of capital is is uh, tough for a lot of people. When you look back on some of those characters, were there for clues? Good guys, smart guys, hardworking guys. Grant Fagerheim's one of the hardest working guys you'll know. Murray Edwards is the hardest working guy you'll know. Dave Wilson is the smartest guy you know. Mike Rose sits down with the geologists every day. These guys are hardworking guys. Um I'm not saying all of them are from Saskatchewan, but pretty bread and butter type guys, you know, nothing fancy, nothing fancy on their cap structures. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a lighter note, looking back on your career, what's been the favorite uh, period of your career thus far? Peters and Company was fabulous and, and First Energy was fabulous. You know, <laughs> that was from 25 years old to 45. So that was pretty good. I had a great run at Canaccord. And right now, yeah, family's my focus and that's what I like doing. And Westgate's my purpose on the business side. And those are that's it. If you were to look back on a 30-year-old Rick Grafton, what advice would you give him? Maybe be a little more humble. <laughs> Maybe be a little more humble. Well, that's uh that's pretty good. The only thing I want to, you know, I really when I say I think the next decade is going to be the best. I really want people to realize that I'm not a crazy man. This is going to be the best. The last 50 years were better than the 50 years before that. There's issues out there, but the province of Alberta is going to be a great place to live. We have 320 days of sunshine. We got the great outdoors, highly educated working group. Like This is a great time. And and that's what we really have to focus on. And then the issues that we have that I don't need to touch on, we need to put that energy in fixing them. And I think we're going to do that. And I think we have to think outside the box on how we fix problems because how they've been dealt with in the past hasn't worked. And I think we can do that. And I, this isn't a plug for Danielle Smith. I know she's got people trying to figure out how to do that, but I'll let her do that on her podcast. But we're addressing issues to make this place, our education system better, our health situation better, our business climate better. And for example, getting that Alberta pension plan here from CPP is so important and people are worried about returns. But the bottom line is if we get a large pool of capital here, We'll build a great industry here, and our returns will be better than CPP over the next decade. So we need those pools of capital here. And we get that pool of capital here. We get Heritage Fund built up. These pools of capital are why places like New York and London are prosperous. And these pools of capital help employment, education, the venture capital that it opens up. So new technologies, new technologies on on every slice and sub-slice a business of what technology do. So we need more capital here. Capital is the key to driving successful, healthy economies. Uh, speaking from my own experiences, as a someone looking to start out in energy, that capital-intensive business with high barriers to entry, what would you tell someone that is looking to start out in energy that may find it difficult to get going? What do you suggest? Because I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that would like to get going in energy, but it's really hard. 
you got to develop a specialty and an expertise and you got to then build a team of guys, then you can find the capital. Bright ideas will find the capital. Got to find the right, uh, the next play, the next hot play. <laughs> well, the plays are out there. This uh, technology, I mean, all of these plays that we're talking about, they were there 20 years ago, but you couldn't drill multilaterals around them. And now that we can drill multilaterals, I mean, the concept of going down a mile and going out one mile or two miles, that didn't exist back in the 80s. You, you didn't do that. I mean, they started kind of bending the well. Now now they're going down and they're going out a mile or two miles. And, and I'm, I'm sure there's some longer ones out there. So new technologies, the resources are in place, new technologies, and then you put a, a capital structure around. You don't punish people that are spending money. To leave anyone listening, a final message on Westgate for the investor out there, what would you leave them with? Well, we'll be trading in April and we're a small cap growth company, but we're going to grow and we've got a great team of guys and just hired a new geologist and I'm excited. So just watch and see what we can do. Awesome. Also, shout out to Clark at Haywood for connecting us. So oh, good. Yeah. Clark. <laughs> Clark. So there's Clark. He's a great young guy, ambitious, super smart, and and he's a go getter. And there's got a, we got a great syndicate, and Clark is one of the key guys. Awesome. Well, we'll end the formal conversation there. So thank you. Okay. Hello, listeners out there. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Hopefully the episode provided some insights. If you enjoyed the show, check out trose.ca where more episodes are yet to come. You can also subscribe to the podcast where your token of support is much appreciated. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Happy coffee drinking.